So my name is Puya. I am a product dude. Um, you call me product manager, owner, head of product, whatever. So um, my job is product management, and when I'm talking about my job, it's actually my passion. So I'm not just doing it for living. It's uh, really something that um, I uh, enjoy doing it because uh, for me, problem solving is it is 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 fascinating, you know. And a bit about myself. So my degree is in computer science back in 2011 I graduated from Queen Mary University um, of London so since then I've been working in different companies like uh, startups um, in 2011 uh, started working for a, it was a e-commerce solution and then uh, after two years um, joined a, one of the pioneer uh, fintech companies in the UK called Monetize which is now uh, acquired by Fiserv and then uh, moved to IBM a couple of years after that, uh, doing a, a bit of um, consultancy, working with different clients. And eventually in 2006, almost this time, um, I started a new journey um, with Lloyds Bank. So all the time during this journey, I've been a product manager, but the um, journey with the Lloyds Bank was fascinating because... So they started a new program back in 2016 called Machine Intelligence Program. It's pretty much an um, in-house fintech entity, product-led uh, organization that the mission was to use applied science uh, to build different products for different divisions of the company and also for serving the customer. So I had the uh, chance to work uh, with different parts of the bank and to run different experiments with them. Um, and mainly working with the you know on, on problem solving as a lead product owner there and eventually um, I finished my contract two months ago and since then I am actually working on my own consultancy called Pioneer Minds um, hoping to grow that and of course I'm delighted to be selected as one of the featured speakers of product school so uh, my goal today as your guest speaker is to, what I really want uh, is not going to um, give you one example just on one method of experimentation. What I want is to talk about what really experimentation is, why you know, it's important to do, and what is the culture of experimentation. So my objective and goal for you know, by the end of that, hopefully, when you leave, you have an idea of it. If you, um, if you're actually not familiar with this, but experimentation, you will hopefully have an idea of what what is it and why is it important. So, hopefully, it motivates you to go and find more after, uh, more after that. And I will introduce some uh, good resources for you. The structure of this talk would be either structured in three different sections. First, I'm going to demystify a bit of experimentation, what it is. Uh, why it is important, sort of the general uh, overall um, framework. Then I'm going to spend most of the time on the second section, which is about running the experiment. It's important to know how we run the experiment, as in like we start with um, identifying problem um, to basically when we finish and terminate the experiment and learn. And then eventually uh, I will speak about the culture of experimentation, the big picture and the pitfalls that um, uh, you, like, you want to avoid when doing the experimentation. So, there has always been some moments in our life, whether we were, we were taking showers or, you know, sleeping, dreaming or walking on the beach. And these are all, by the way, the decent moments of our life that you come up with an idea and may very much Martin Luther King way, I have an idea, not a dream. So, or it might be a moment that actually you're working with your colleagues or, you know, at work, you come up with an idea, right? And there's not, not a problem with ideas. So idea is great, but Microsoft CEO has got a good code. They say, okay, what if we say this, instead of saying this is an idea, this is an hypothesis, right? Because we don't have any evidence for it. So what if we say it's an hypothesis, we need to go and test it and validate it. And if it was successful, great. If it wasn't, then we move to the next one. So, as an example, let's just start with an example. So example is people need a mobile application to help them find a suitable kind of financial product um, that matches their needs. So, 
what's wrong with this idea? Nothing is wrong with the idea. It's the way we think and the way we act. So we talk about people. Who are these people? What do we mean by people? If we have an idea and we think it's great, then uh, if we have all the resources available to us, uh, should we just go and execute that? Probably not. Probably yes, we execute it, but execute it in a way that we run first experimentation. But so first is that what do we mean by people? Is, are we you know are we talking about kids, teenagers, or you know professionals, or uh, you know married <coughs> single who? And why do we think a mobile application is the actual solution? What is the problem? So why are we jumping to the solution? What is the actual problem here? And how are we so sure? Because we said like. People need a mobile application. Like it's, it's very much kind of like sounds like we're sure about it. So that's why we're moving, shifting from that sort of idea. It looks like a vision to a sort of an assumption. So it's and it's not just changing the words. It's the way we think, and that's really important. That's part of the culture. That's part of the mindset of an entrepreneur or a product manager or product dude or duties. And uh, so an idea on its own is an assumption because it needs testing and evidence. Evidence means data, something that you can prove the idea works. If you have an idea, you have the evidence, you don't need to actually run experiment then. So back to our, our, our uh, idea, now we make it a bit better. So we talked about people need a mobile application. Now here we say we assume, right? By saying we assume, we are actually saying that indirectly we're saying that we're not sure and that's a good thing that we're not sure because that means that we need to test it right and then we say we assume there is a population of people so here we are improving we have improved our original statement as we say all people is a population of people it's still ambiguous you still don't know what the specific uh, segment of that people we're talking about but we continue saying that would want to find a suitable mortgage product on the move and receive advice whenever they need. So now we're not talking about a mobile application, we're talking about the problem. So the problem is finding a suitable mortgage or it's, it's, it's what we want to achieve. But the problem here is that sometimes we're on the move and uh, we want to do our job. The jobs to be done here is to find a suitable mortgage and we want to do it anytime we want. So that's how we improve, we have improved from the idea to the assumption. And the assumption itself is still not testable, right? So it's still ambiguous and it has different hypotheses within that. So now we know that an assumption can be broken down to multiple hypotheses that can be measured, can be specific uh, and can be tested. Now, I'm showing you an example, a hypothetical hypothesis I've come, uh, come up with, um, but it's not that you jump from an assumption to this hypothesis. So there is a process that we, I'm going to, the whole point of this uh, talk today is to how we, from the idea to the assumption, how you get to the hypothesis and how you execute that. So, but just to give you early visibility, from the previous slide, we said a population of People. Here we're talking about mortgage brokers, so now we know that specific segment that we want to um, solve a problem for. So we can ha that they can have access to mortgage advisor on the move. So again, that's a problem we want to tackle. Uh, they are on the move and they need it like 24-7. And then we talk about a sort of a solution uh, that we think we're not yet sure that might help them. So and that's why we say to verify that hypothesis, that's that statement, we have to test this solution. For example, here, virtual, mess, uh, virtual mortgage assistant. Put in the mobile application of the bank, uh, of, uh, let's assume we are a bank, uh, and we have a uh, mobile banking application already, so let's put that in there. And then we're talking about the measure, right? The metrics. So the metrics that we want to go after. And then, we're talking about, so we are right, and that's a target metric, that's what we, the, the first one is the metric that is important for us, the second one is the one that needs to be improved. So, going to the definition, we will, we will come back to uh, the hypothesis again, but just wanted to give you a sort of a 
uh, early visibility and how we get from the idea to assumption to the hypothesis. So the defi uh, definition here, the, so go back to the idea is a general assumption on its own, right? Needs testing, needs evidence. The assumption then is a, a uh, but it's, uh, it, it's, there are a set of hypotheses embedded in one assumption and the assumption itself doesn't have the metric, right? But the hypothesis then is one of the, so uh, the, you can derive from the assumption multiple hypotheses and then the hypothesis is the one that needs to be tested. It is a specific, it's measurable, it's testable, and it has a target metric and the benchmark of what's actually going on today. So <clears throat> that's really the difference between idea, assumption and hypothesis. So now we need to test this hypothesis, right? And when we say testing, that's here we go. We've got the experiment. So what is the experiment then? Yes, it is a sort of uh, building things, but at, at, and it's, uh, at its core, it's a problem-solving framework, right? So we want to move from solutionizing things from the beginning to more like a looking at the root cause problem. What, what's actually causing the problem. And then it's a framework, the experimentation is a frame means that it's not a one of that, it's a process that you need to go through until you get to the point that you have everything, then you put it into practice as in like execute the um, experiment and you have a certain tools to help you to, to go through that journey until you finish the experiment. So that's the what, that's what the experiment really means. But why do we need to do that? Again, recapping. So, in a nutshell, we want to find the right problem and then building the right solution. But we're going to, we're going to spend most of the time on finding, finding the right problem. We don't want to actually build things and then put it in the hands of users and customers and then realizing it's either not the right solution or it's not working, it's not built right, as I say. So, if you break down that statement on the top, say so, it's for establishing a sort of data-driven culture so that we make decisions by following data. And then we say identifying the right solution uh, that adds more value to the existing way that a uh, user uses a service or a task. Right? So we may actually come up with something uh, build it, that's, that adds value, but not necessarily add more value to the current uh, way uh, customers or users um, using uh, a sort of service or product. Also, it's helpful to measure the usability and impact on the user. How usable is this? So by running the experiment, you will find out the solution you're proposing. Is, you, is it usable? What is the impact, the overall impact on the customer? And also, as an organization, you are de-risking the whole investment, future investment you want to put on building something that eventually may be used or not used. So you don't want to risk with all this resource, money, etc. You want to start small. And the outcome, outcome you get out of the experimentation is the evidence, is the data that, is, that sits next to your idea and tells you whether you should do it or not. So that was the what, that was the why, and now the process we're going through is the experimentation framework, is the stage by stage, it's iterative, means that you don't do one th and then second one and then finish, no, it keeps going. Right? Start with problem, then hypothesis, design, run, and learn. So that was the first part. My hypothesis so far is that uh, you've been listening. Well, let's try that. Let's let's get some evidence. And the second part now. The second part is uh, to tell you how to execute that. Let's go back to this. Starts with identifying problem at the top. So, our job as product people or entrepreneurs is to live and breathe and stay with the problem more than anything. Stay with it as long as it needs. Uh, you need to until it's not a problem anymore. It means that you work mostly on the problem until and test it, test different solutions until you get to the right solution. So, <clears throat> as an entrepreneur, then, which I think product management is an entrepreneurial uh, 
job. Um, I think the mindset is that we start from finding the right problems among all the problems there, there are, finding the right one, which we spend most of the time on that, and then test different solutions until we get to the right one. And then build up that product after all these tests build it, and build it right. And then build an organization that can deliver that product in a scale and eventually build an industry. But it all starts with knowing your customer. So if you want to actually go and find a problem, find a problem for who? For the customer. So it all starts as who is facing this problem at all, right? And what, okay, and if you find the who, then what are they doing? What's the job if they do? What's the job to be done? And why they are doing this job? I mean, what's, what, what's, what, are, what are they trying to achieve? And in achieving that, what is the pain that they are actually facing? So it all starts with the who. But if you are a big organization or you are a small organization, you are one man band, entrepreneur, whatever, um, you need some tools, some ways to find your, uh, to, to understand your users, uh, your customers, and understand the who and find the who. So the sources, some of the sources, it's not an exhaustive list, but main thing you go out to speak to, to the customers if you find them. And if, if it's a B2B, for example, product, you can actually run effective workshop with the uh, stakeholders, with the subject matter experts of that division, for example. You need to uh, you know, find a problem and uh, improve something for your customer service. Uh, in knowing who is using those, you know, knowing who the users are, you can actually identify those and then you know, set up uh, some effective workshops to go through the different journeys they go and different tools they use, etc. Conduct surveys or speak to your support team. So support team, if you're actually building something for the customer, you need to see. So they, if and if you already have a um, proposition or service, so it must. Uh, I assume that you have already a customer service. The customer service all the time deals with the customer, so they are good resource in giving you enough input about knowing the customers. Look at the complaints. So complaints is talking about something wrong with your digital proposition. And you can, you know, because marketing and sales, just like the customer support, they are at the front line, you can provide good input. And use existing data. So existing data, you might have it in your organization, or you may want to go and find, um, you know, the users of your competitors, for example, the market, in the market, the reports, blogs, etc. And if you already are, you, you, you're working in an organization that uh, they run experiments, so the whole point is to share those experiments, so you go back to learning from those experiments as well. So these are the sources of information you can use in knowing your customer. If you go back to our example, our assumption, so we said we assume there is a population of people. So let's break that population of people, uh, just for the sake of you know, um, this talk, that can be mortgage brokers, can be you know, single people under 30, can be married, uh, have a family, can be men, women, you can go as specific as you want. But again, we pick one um, for um, the purpose of this talk. So pick the mortgage broker, and if that's going to be your specific user, you have to then put yourself in their shoes. How? So there is a tool for this, a good tool, powerful tool called Empathy Map. That means you first need to think like your customer, and by doing that, to understand their characters, they, how they think, uh, what they hear, what they see, what they say, and it's all important because it's all built of that character for you, so you can actually build the right, understand their problems and then build the right thing for them. So in our example, mortgage brokers, the way they think, so it's important for them to find the right uh, mortgage product for their uh, client because it's all about their uh, credit and trust, right, uh, that they build up with their clients. What they hear from their colleagues is that um, you know, the, the advisors of specific banks are not really helpful. Uh, so, you know, every time they call, uh, you know, they, they, they hear different things. 
what they say is it's really hard to get hold of one of these advisors, let's say for Bank X, so uh, to, to help them find more information about different products, different uh, mortgage products. And what they see is a lot of information that's confusing on their website. So that's how you build up, a, and it, it's, it's only one example, so you can actually come up with different things that they hear, see, feel, or say, and see. So once you build that customer character, then you still need to go and find out what they do, what that customer, what mortgage job is. So another good, useful, um, tool, powerful tool is just coming from the value proposition design from a strategizer. So I've actually used it for the, for, for the past few years and it's really working and it's a very powerful tool. So the value proposition canvas consists of the value map and customer profile. <clears throat> this is what you can see, is the customer profile first. So it talks about the customer jobs first and what they gain from doing those jobs and then what their, what their pains are in achieving those jobs. The way then you prioritize, then you need to prioritize once you come up with all these jobs, gains, pains, you need to prioritize those. So you prioritize the customer jobs based on the importance of that, the gains based on the essential, how essential is one gain or whether it's a nice to have or it's really something that adds value. And <clears throat> the pain they have, whether it's actually quite extreme pain or it's something not a pain or they can actually live with it. So if you go back to our example, a customer or mortgage broker's job, and let's assume it's already prioritized for you. Um, we have run our workshops with them, we have actually done our user research. Now we're at a point that we know the customer's job is to find a suitable mortgage uh, for their clients. Uh, the other jobs they have is to know how to submit an application and then learn about different products they have because then they can actually <clears throat> be more knowledgeable about different offerings on one bank uh, to, so that they can actually advise other clients. The first one we get, so the, 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 the gains out of the finding a suitable mortgage is that there's a high chance that uh, that mortgage will be approved for that client and then mortgage brokers get their commission and build up that trust and uh, build up their network, build up their um, and grow their, their own business. But the pains they have is picking a wrong product for the client because they can't possibly find the right information on the website, or they're confusing, or you know, it's, it's, it's not easy to get hold of one of one of the uh, the bank's uh, financial advisor to help them with the, uh, with selecting the right mortgage. So these are the really the examples just to show you what how we 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 after we build the <coughs> the customer characters, then we have to start with building their profile, what they do, what their pains are, what they gain. But then, on the left hand side of the canvas is the value proposition. So now we know that, now that we know the, the, um, what the jobs are, what the pains are, what the gains are, now is the time, and it's not just the work of the product person, so the product person is also work with your engineering team, UX, you get all these inputs to, 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 to come up with a abstract or hypothetical uh, solution, you're still not sure whatever you come up with the product and services here, still not sure, that's why you're building this up to test it, right? So here you get inputs from more you know, engineering, UX, etc. So you say, okay, so we have these jobs, we have these pains, now what should we build, right? So this is the pro product and services that you're offering and you can also, <clears throat> based on the importance or how significant they are, you can actually prioritize those. And if you build that product, what sort of gain we are creating for the, the customer? And it's kind of, you can map it to the pains they have originally, right? And the pain reliever, so by building that, what sort of pains we are relieving, right? In nutshell, what problem we are solving. So going back to our example again, so here, we thought that, okay, for, the, for those jobs and pains and gains that uh, we found that, found that, we think that a sort of a virtual mortgage assistant can help because it's always available to them, right? And it's 24 seven and it's consistent. So you basically, if you talk to a um, virtual assistant, virtual mortgage assistant, it always gives you the, right, the, the, the same answer, right? 
rather than actually, because people can have different interpretation. If you'd speak to, for example, a financial advisor in the back, in the bank, in 95%, you know, they are right, but there is a, like a threshold of 5% that people can have either bias or even different interpretation, right? So, virtual mortgages, and we think the gain it creates is going to advise the uh, advise uh, the, the mortgage brokers with the right product and it's always available it's also reduced the number of calls that the, the, the mortgage brokers need to actually make to the bank for example it's also important to say that you don't come up with one service only right so or product so here down there which uh, <clears throat> is for the sake of this pro this this talk we um, we put in more, you know, we kind of downgrade it, is they improve the, another service, another thing you can do is to improve your the information architecture in your website, right? So the whole point I'm trying to convey and say is that you don't just come up with one, because you're not going to just build a one hypothesis. The whole point of experimentation is to try different things. Right, so now you map the both, right and left. So you build up the, pro the, the customer profile, and now you have the... the um, the value map. That's how you join them. That's how the gains, uh, the, <coughs> the, the the products uh, and services created is mapped to the pains and gains and the customer's job. So that was so the first bit, first stage of this iterative process of experimentation. So in identity, just to do a recap, we've just finished identifying the problem, right? In identifying problem, we start with the user, building their characters, their, their, their characteristics, uh, profile, building their profile after that, and then work on the jobs they need to do, the pains, the gains they have, and then come up with sort of a system, that they, the products and services that we think uh, is, is going to solve their problem. So that was the identifying the problems. Now, we go and create our hypothesis. So good structure here that is very useful is we start with we believe that that says that we believe it it's our hypothesis we're not sure then you explain what the hypothesis is right to verify that then we will run the experiment so that would be the description of the what sort of experiment you are doing plus what sort of service you're offering and uh, that you're going to build it and experiment it and then Doing that, we need to measure the metrics. So that, those are the metrics we want to put in place to go and get enough interactions and get enough data and then analyze these metrics. And there should be also a target uh, metric that we are right so that eventually we want to see whether it be disproved or uh, uh, whether the hypothesis is, is disproved or proved. So that would be the target success measure we put in place. So now we're going to go back to our original hypothesis that I showed you um, earlier. So we believe the mortgage brokers, specific, can have access to a mortgage advisor on the move. And we're talking about the problems, right? They have what they want to do, what they want to achieve. So they, to verify that, we'll implement a virtual mortgage assistant. <coughs> and now you know how we have come from our assumption to where we know, for example, we think, we believe that this sort of tool or product can actually help, you know? And then measure the number of times the virtual assistant can offer the right product. So that's our, the, met, the metric we want to go after. Also, there is another metric. We also want to um, measure the number of calls they make. So if we assume they, the current uh, mechanism is for the mortgage brokers to call the bank and speak to financial advisor and say, okay, I've got this client, these are the information, what sort of mortgage can you offer, right? So instead of doing that, then they talk into a virtual mortgage assistant, right? So by doing that, then we believe that there will be a reduction in the calls. And then eventually, these are their, our target, um, target metrics. So we say, for example, by the way, it's, uh, it's, it's all hypothetical. I just come up with it just for the sake of this talk. Um, <clears throat> so we say, for, for example, you're right if our VA could advise a right uh, product by 80%, for example. 
and the number of glucose reduced by 30%. And you can do your own math, but this is pretty much hypothetical, just to show you how we have come from idea assumption to this hypothesis. So now we talked about the metrics, but how you get those metrics? What are the metrics, right? So metrics generally is a measurement of the task your customer does with your feature, your product, your service. So it's, you can divide it into whether it's a primary or it's a secondary. So in our example, number of calls made to the bank is a primary. Also, the number of times that the virtual assistant can help and can provide the right uh, product um, is also a primary. So these are because these are the ones that defines the success of this test or experiment. The secondary, so each of these two, in our example, can be break down into, broken down into different ones. And it's always useful to put in place some events as a secondary metrics. Because in achieving your, you know, in achieving your metric, you want to see different journeys they go, right? And each, in each journey, you will put different metrics in place to understand uh, the details as well as the overall thing. And when you set a metric in your hypothesis, you can use both qualitative and the quantitative. So you, you would normally need both. So the qualitative is the usability testing, the, you know, the customer interviews, voice of the customer from your customer support. But the quantitative is more like analytical or you know, the events you put in, you, you know, you code it in your application that when they use it, it gathers all that information, all the surveys. So now you have, so this was, this was our one hypothesis, right? But event, uh, ideally at this stage you have already come up with few hypotheses, more than one. Because you're not going to make just one hypothesis and go test one thing and then go and build or not build, right? So assuming now you have multiple hypotheses, which one you want to go after first, right? So there is a way to prioritize those. So David Bland from Precoil has got a, uh, introduced a new a, a tool that's called the Assumption or Hypothesis uh, Mapping. But it all starts with seeing your hypothesis from different aspects before you actually go and prioritize those. From desirability aspect, whether it does customer want it, right? And it's then it's up to the product and the UX normally to define that. Whether it's feasible, is, is it something we can do it as an organization? Do we have the enough skills or is the technology mature enough to help us uh, achieve that? Is it right for our brand? Is it actually legal to build something like, some, you know, something like that? Or is it actually viable? Should we do this at all? You know, it, it, we may build the best thing, but it may cost us a lot, and the money we generate after that might be less than the investment we put in, right? So, in prioritizing your hypothesis, it's important you see your hypothesis from desirability, feasibility, and viability, and then you can use that assumption map or hypothesis map it's a quadrant on the top the importance of the hypothesis down unimportant where you have no evidence on the right and when you have evidence so each of these colors so is a viability feasibility desirability right the experiment you want to run sits on the right quadrant there it means that these are the hypotheses that are really important for us and we don't have any evidence because there are here that they are important for us, but we have evidence, right? So we don't need to do it. We just need to, you know, share it with the um, with the organization and decide whether we need to we go after that or not. And the one on the down down button is something that probably you don't want to go after because um, either you have evidence or you don't have evidence. But it means that the reason you put it down is that it's not important. Now you have prioritized your hypothesis. Now you there is another tool to um, put in place, which is a test score. Another good tool that you can use is um, from strategizer again. So test score is basically you put the hypothesis, uh, you know, uh, to to this to kind of like give it in a structure and um, document it. 
And now you're at the end of creating the hypothesis. So we covered the identifying the problem now, and then we create the hypothesis. Now is the time to go and build it. But before building, we have to have a team. So what's the, what, what would the team look like? At its core, it's a cross-functional team. It means that you need the product, you need engineering, you need user experience, and depends on the product, but normally you will have a data science or you know, analytic team. It, that's, that's really the core. So you need the cross-functional teams. You need a team that is dedicated because um, the experimentation might be something that for the organization that they're not really, it's not their habit to run experiments, and may not really see it as a, as, as, a, as a very strategic thing to do. That's why they may not provide you with the right resources. So, but it's important to have dedicated resources to who can actually focus on that with you. And it's also important, of course, as a product, and you, you actually have to be customer-centric yourself, but it's also good that the other, uh, you know, the other part of the team, engineering, uh, is also kind of like, they also understand the customer. And of course, the team needs to be analytic, they need to know the data. Well, on the right-hand side, you see here, I've added, like, cross-functional team plus interested parties. So the job is being done by the cross-functional team, but you want to probably open up that team, bring in more people from the organization, which is really important if you want to establish a product-led or uh, a experiment-led organization. It means that you let people in, and you don't want to make actually the troop, but there are relevant people who might be interested in doing so, and by being in the thing and seeing how you actually run it, they learn and they spread the word. So it can be leadership, it can be subject matter experts, etc. So that's really the, uh, the team. Now you have to decide what sort of experiments you want to run and that depends on your hypothesis. So your hypothesis will tell you what type of experiment you need to do. So, in generally, you would divide it into low fidelity and high fidelity. Low fidelity is basically, you know, those wireframes that, you know, they can look like the real thing, but it's basically, it's not a working gap, it's not really coded, it's built it's a wireframe, it's a prototype, it's a, um, like, a <clears throat> like, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with, uh, you know, there are lots of tools like Azure, and Vision, etc. But, thing is that the customer interaction is with them is quite not quite but it's limited it's not as it's not that you, you you can't really get that much of interaction in compare with the high fidelity which is a working application and the other difference between the low fidelity and the high fidelity is that the in the high fidelity you can define events so you can capture all these data but in the low fidelity probably is more qualitative data you can capture. In the higher fidelity, so it can be a front-end site, it, you know, if the hypothesis, for example, I mean, forget about this mortgage thing, but if you have a hypothesis to test the user behavior on your website, let's say your product is, uh, is a website, uh, you may want to just um, do the A-B testing or painted door testing. These are different type of experimentation do at the front end without actually changing anything in the back end system. But you may want to actually, uh, you know, it depends on, again, on your hypothesis, you may want to, if it's an SDK that you need to build, or the database needs to be built, it would be at the back end. So, but the point here I'm trying to make here is that based on your hypothesis, uh, you would decide uh, the type of the experiment. So now you have the team, you know what experiments you want to run based on your hypothesis. Now, before you go and run it, you have one thing. You need, you need to steal one thing, and that's the user group. That's people who try it for you, right? So, user group or model office. So model office to model is more like for B2B when you're working within an organization and um, let's say you're building something for your marketing team or your customer support. So model office would be those real you know, uh, users. Um, the user groups, again, the same, but it would be, for example, for a B2C or the real customer, you have millions of them out there, for example. So, in nutshell, it's a sample size uh, of the customer segment uh, for whom uh, you have built something and now you need them to try it for you. Um, 
So it's important you form that before getting to the running stage. So you may even start from at the very beginning when you start with identifying problem. You have to uh, <clears throat> work in parallel to build that up from the beginning. Otherwise, if you design and build experiment and then say, okay, uh, who's going to use it? It may del it it will definitely delay your experiment. So you want to actually start sorry, to form that. And then once you have that group, uh, you just don't give it to them to test it. You will share with them what the goal of this experiment is, what they're trying. You don't necessarily need to give them instruction of what, how to use it, because probably one of your um, main goal is also to see how intuitive your, um, your product is. But it's more like giving them, okay, why we're doing this. And it's important to put in place a sort of an instructional mechanism to mitigate the risks for the risk that you know, and also a sort of a plan for the risks that you don't know, but at least you know that there might be some risks that you're not sure what they would be, but at least some sort of a plan in place. So, we've covered the problems, create hypothesis design, now we're going to run the experiment. Assuming we have this model office in place, when you run the experiment, before that you've got to make sure you have all the mechanisms in place to collect the data, because the whole point of running this experiment is to collect data interactions, right? Otherwise, uh, it would be a waste of time and resources. And you're not, when you start the experiment, you just not give it to them and then say goodbye, go, I'll come back in two weeks and to see how you get on with it. You stay in touch with your users, you continuously get feedback from them as they use it, um, for the good thing and also for identifying the risks if it raises. And also, after you build up that and you put it into the, you know, you start running the experiment, it's important to still have your team available. You may not need the whole team again during that experiment, during that run time. But at least if something comes up that you need to actually make quick improvement to the, pro to the, to the, to the experiment, um, then you have the resources to quickly make that happen. Otherwise, uh, it would be a failure. In, uh, even if it's little things that needed to be improved, uh, you need to actually fix it. Otherwise, the whole experiment would be a failure. And oh, that might be always, a, you know, not always, but in the, even if it's 1%, it might be a worst case scenario. So then you should think about an exit plan. If something happens and you need to kill the experiment, you should have a plan. So it doesn't come as a surprise to you. That was the run. The last bit of that is now you have run it, finished, and now you go and learn. So you collect the data, qualitative, quantitative, whatever you could get from the interactions. Then you start working on the data. It's always a good practice to work as a team on the data and uh, use your data science team or your uh, you know, analytical team to help you with analyzing that data. And then before you issue the report, the final report, the final learning, probably it's a good idea, it's a good practice to issue a draft version and just share it with a limited number of people to even if data doesn't lie, you may have different interpretation of that. So that's why you want to make sure and you want to validate your thoughts, your, your, your reading of the data with others, right? And then when you get to the stage that you think, okay, so this is really what data says and people are aligned on the interpretation of that, then you issue the final report and you share it, right? So it doesn't actually stick in, you, in your hand or your... Uh, division. So the whole point of this experimentation is not only solving the right problem, it's also to share that with the entire organization, whether if it's a big corporate, I put it in some place as in that, for example, that that's the usefulness of these things like a learning card to instruct to document these so you can actually share. Right, so we are at the end of this experimentation framework. Uh, so just to recap, problem solving, knowing the user, build up their custom, uh, their, their profile, come up with sort of a um, service and products, come up, building up a hypothesis, um, shaping the team to build that um, tool, and then shaping and forming the uh, model office, and then run it. 
and then learn from it. So, one more thing is left here. It's going to talk about the experimentation culture. But before that, so this was the framework, experimentation. But where does it fit into the bigger picture? So what is the big picture? This was only the experimentation framework and process. So here, you can see on the top, is what we discussed, the experimentation process. It's iterative on its own. And on the bottom, it's a normal product delivery life cycle, which is on its own, is an iterative agile, right? But the whole thing is also iterative, means that on the top, what you're achieving is what is the right thing to build. On the bottom is what um, building it right. After you find out what is the right thing to build, building it right. So, start from learning. Your learning, your results will be an input to your backlog. And obviously backlog and the roadmap continuously talk, right, inform each other. Um, so it goes to the end when you build things in the scales, the customer uses it, this customer here is not a model of it, it's actually the customer uh, in real time. The feedback you get goes back to your backlog of the problems you have on the top. So that's really the whole picture, that's you put both processes into one. And as you see here, if you talk about when you need to do experiments, as the picture says, it's every time, right? So it's not really a phase. It's not just one phase in your product development life cycle. It says it happens, it is in the loop, right? So think about it like a habit, right? It's a habit that should happen all the time. But if you are in the product discovery phase, so you may have a lot of, so there's a, the heavyweight experimentation would happen in the product discovery because it's actually new things, new feature. Whereas actually sometimes you have the feature, your product in place, you want to optimize that, so you may do less uh, experiments. So it would be frequent or occasion. But it's still, you know, part of the whole. And it always happens, should happen ideally, if you are a company that does innovation. Right, so the culture. What is a culture? Is it not something that we think and we act? That's really the culture. It's the way we think. And then that thing will lead, lead us to act in a specific way. So if you talk about the culture of experimentation, the way we think is that it's a pro process. The process we went through is not just practical profit. It's the way you also you think, right? You think about the problem first. You think about customer then. Then you build up a hypothesis, etc. It's the way you think, and then you will have a framework to implement that, your, implement that way of thinking, which went through that tools and framework. It's important to think as hypothesis and over idea. And now my hypothesis is that you know why, right? And then you go and test it. The way we think about disproving and the failure. So if you disprove a hypothesis, it's a success, it's not a failure. So it's really important to know that if you disprove your hypothesis, you haven't failed it means that you just found one more way that doesn't end up in, build, in finding the right thing to build. Right? So, but it's important to disprove it's safe. And so you don't, it doesn't have a big impact on either the customer or your brand. Or, you know, it doesn't have a big impact on the resources or, uh, you know, the funding, etc. So disprove, you might have heard about the fail safe, fail fast, but let's change it to disprove safe, learn fast. The way we think means that if we think, if we, if we make decisions, sometimes we make decisions because, you know, by authority, by gut feeling, but good feeling. But in the experimentation culture, the culture of experimentation, you make decisions by following data because data doesn't lie. And you think always about the impact that has on the customer because you put yourself in the customer's shoes and that means it's an iterative process you get continuous feedback continuously um, work on improving that service or product eventually you focus on the outcome so you say outcome that is important not the output necessarily eight things to avoid 
running lengthy experiments. So the whole point of running experiments is to run multiple experiments, right? If you do it a lengthy experiment, means that if you do it like for three months, don't expect your organization to let you yeah, after three months run another one, right? Because already um, uh, using a lot of resources, funding, etc. So make sure the experiment is quick and rapid, and but there is one sprint, two sprints, there's probably not more than two sprints. This is a month. It's two, it's, if you say a sprint is a, um, is a two week. It could be quicker. And designing experiment for a scale. So you're not designing experiment in a scale, right? In experimentation, you build the minimum testable product. Not minimum viable product, minimum testable product. Because again, it, it has impact on the length of the experiment. Not running enough experiment. So if you run, like, let's say, two experiments, if you run one experiment, then jump in to build something, I mean, it, you didn't need to wait to do any experiment. You could have actually started from here. So it was a wrong approach. But it's, it's important you at least run multiple experiments so you know for sure you have enough data that what you're going to build is the right thing. And as I said, this is proving the hypothesis is not a failure, so avoid that sort of thinking. But what is really important that may cause uh, failure in your experiments is picking up the wrong metrics from the first place. So if you, even if you do everything correctly, going through the process, but if you set the wrong metric by mistake, you run the experiment, and then you eventually find out okay, that wasn't the right metric to look at. It was another one. And we have to run it again then. So that means the waste of resource and investment. And sometimes, you remember I talked about the secondary metrics. So sometimes you break the original metric to few other sub-metrics. So the secondary metrics means that eventually get gather lots of lots of data and you get confused by that. So sometimes it's better probably not to go very much that, breaking down the original pri uh, the primary metrics or sometimes even if you break that down to many um, secondary metrics, eventually if you gather a lot of data, you definitely make sure you have a data science to help you with analyzing that data. And it's wrong to think that experimentation is only done by the UX. The UX is quite crucial part of the experimentation. You can't really think that an experimentation being done without them, but they're not necessarily the only party that runs the, the, the experiments. So they do the user research, and they're helping product, uh, the, the discovery, uh, identifying problems, etc. But it's more like thinking um, that it's only the UX and the wireframes they do, they can go and test it. Yes, they can, but it might not be enough. And if you are working in an organization, it's a small or big, that um, experimentation is not yet become a habit there. Uh, don't expect people actually know what it means. They may even say, yeah, they, they need to make sure that you put in place uh, the right process, uh, the one that we went through, and you be an advocate of um, making sure, advocate of experimentation and making sure the right process is being followed. So don't expect that everyone know that. It's, uh, if you are going to run experimentation, uh, you need to educate others as well. Right, so I had a goal at the beginning uh, to, to give you an idea of what experimentation is, why is it important, how to run a successful one. So hopefully now you know something about it, but hopefully you're motivated to go more into the details. And if you want to do that, a um, very good resource which recently came out is the book called Testing Business Ideas by David Bland and Alex Osterwalder from Strategizer. Um, I haven't read the whole book yet because it was only uh, released two weeks ago, a week ago, but because I have been using the methods of Strategizer for a long time and I've been reading other books, I know for a fact that uh, it's a very good tool. Also other uh, resources, Product Talk by Teresa Torres, if you go online, uh, there's a 
uh, lots of good resources there to to read, and it's mostly free. Uh, on some often might be free. Um, the Real Startup Book is is a free ebook. It's written by a um, few entrepreneurs. Uh, you can find good um, knowledge about experimentation, run, uh, you know, the discovery, etc. And also, uh, if you go on the Optimizely website, uh, there are lots of good resources on the experimentation as well. But it's all theory. You learn. You you can read lots of books. Eventually. What's important is that you need to put that in practice. You need to start doing that. So on that note, keep experimenting. Thank you.